Hey everybody, Jeff here. With I'm joined today by Justin Armenta from J Digitizing Studios, and we're both from the Embroidery Nerd. And today is a let me find the picture. Digitizing nine one one. We'll do that until Justin rolls his eyes. I think we've <laughs> successfully achieved that goal. Um, so, Justin, you've got your screen up. You want me to go ahead and bring that on, or would you like me to pull up mine? Sure. Oh, see, you got you got control over the button, so you can just do it too. I got control. All right. Oh. My volume here. So we saw a post in the group about this design. Let me pull up there. So this is the the finish hat that they're doing from the original file that they're having some issues with with the 3D puff. And right just off the bat. one or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just just a few. Um, actually, the, the file is, this image doesn't do justice to how off the file, I should say. Um, I wanted to say something, too, as far as I did Shizen 911. I don't want anybody to feel that we're ripping apart, because we don't know who digitized this originally. Um, it might be a novice. It might be someone, you know, that doesn't know how to digitize for 3D Puff. Whatever the reason. We're not, we're not trying to degrade anybody's work. We're just trying to help people out when we see a design that could use some tweaks and, and point out what's, what's obvious to us. So, um, but as you can see, there's some, there's some issues like some, some gaps in, in between the two colors. The ends aren't too clean. Um, so when I saw the post, I, I offered the, uh, the poster that I would take a look at her design and see what we got going on. Uh, so first off, I can see that the, the design's on the left panel of the hat. So we are working with a smaller design instead of across the full front. Um, so right off the bat, let me kind of pull this apart here. I see that there is this kind of weird underlay. And I don't know if the intention was to use this to cut the stitches and then they're going to come back over with the, with the top stitching. Um, but, but the fact that the top stitching isn't all that much wider than the bottom stitching, kind of an issue. So I know, um, and you might recall this from way back when foam first started, but I know that there was actually a theory where you would drive an edge run underlay with a short stitch length around the foam to attempt, attempt to perforate it out. And that's kind of what it looks like was done here to me. Right, yeah. And what it, what it looks like is not only do we have that, that edge walk uh, right out to the edge of this, of this under base, um, to I'm assuming cut the foam, but the the shapes themselves they they have a satin stitch themselves, and so it looks like it's a let me not group here. Yeah, it's it's somewhat of a light density satin stitch, uh, 0.5 with an edge run underlay. So yeah, it's obviously an attempt to to cut the foam first. Um, in that technique, I guess. Are you supposed to pull the foam after the first layer and then come back over it with the, the top stitches? I believe so. And then and then that's when you get the little pop out to the edge run underlay sticking out because that's typically that that's why I've seen people discourage that method is right. because when you do come over with your top stitching occasionally that edge run underlay, if it's not inset far enough, the needle will catch on top of it and pop that on the outside and now you've got a loop or a little piece of foam that you have to deal with, but more so would be the loop that would be the problem. Right. And, and to tell you the truth, way, 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 way back in the day when 3D foam was first hitting the industry, that's the way I was taught. And we, and we tried at the place that I was at and we had no success with 3D foam. We just didn't touch it because of that. Um, yeah, I remember the, the fighting with it, with that, that technique. Back in the day, uh, old man. Back in the day. 
Well, I'm going to jump out. We're going to grab our one comment here. Letty's watching with us. Hello, Letty. How are you doing? And if you are watching, go ahead and let us know in the comments where you're watching from. So, yeah. That was my commercial. Just just, uh, pointing out the the few things that I see right off the bat. You have the the underlay that's obviously there to to cut out the the foam. Um, The top stitching itself. Zoom in here. As you can see, it has a, a, a zigzag underlay. So again, 3D foam, typically you're not using a dense underlay when you're trying to do 3D foam. You're using the density of the satin stitch itself to, to perforate the foam. And you're, you're trying not to put as, as many layers of the underlay and the top stitching to mash down the phone too much so so one uh, thing i found really interesting that i'm going to add on to that when i was watching it is it looks like the majority of the letters and not on the blue letters but on the other letters not only does it have the zigzag it's also having a travel run in it depending where they put their start and their stop points so you're laying down a zigzag under underlay on the black stitching but you're also ramming a um center run underlay in there probably my guess is unintentionally they're just trying to adjust where their start and stop points are but typically when you're digitizing for 3d puff you manually path everything at least i do well that's one thing that i noticed that you you can see the the tie-ins or the the lock stitches in here and they did the closest uh, point connection to me for cleaner foam instead of you know coming around ending here coming up to the top coming back here just to get that jump stitch to the to the closest point connection when i'm doing foam i would rather have one you know continual loop of a, of a satin and end at the end and have an extra trim that's just me well just I don't, a lot of times too that i have seen personally is that when you're running and you run like the base of the D up and then you run up to the top and you come back down. If you if you set your pathing like that in the software, oftentimes with foam, it doesn't give enough of an overlap for Correct. it to push that closed. Correct. Yeah, I mean, if, if you are in a design and, and you are trying to keep that needle down and, and no trims in between, yeah, you would definitely not want to use a solid object and basically change your start and stops. As you can see here, they have their start over here because it's next to the Y. Their stop over here to, to go to the next letter, um, which, to tell you the truth, there's not even another black letter there, so I'm not sure why they did that. Um, but, yeah, I would have manually digitized it where I stopped the satin here, you know, walked my way up to the top, capped it, came back down, added that extra uh, overlap, not to mention how to add a bridge here, because anytime two satins meet, I usually use a bridge to make sure that that, that foam doesn't come peeking out when, when you're having satins coming from two different directions. Yep. Um, another obvious thing to me was, again, the fact that they're using this, this under base to make the cut, there is an absence of caps on the top stitches. So, so, um, so we got the underlay stitches cutting, uh, the density seemed to be off. The density in this is only a 0.33, which is pretty much just a, a standard satin. That's a little bit heavy on density. Uh, it's got a zigzag underlay that you normally not use for 3d puff. Um, and the biggest thing that I noticed that when I, they had the, artwork the original artwork embedded in it is the because the way they they did the ends of of all the satins this tapered look it completely takes away from the the original design you have the nice clean straight edges of the of the letters in this design and to me this is a completely different font so those are the those are the things that i'm that i was that just stood Obviously. out to you. Yeah. Anything that you saw? Um, yeah, there was actually. So 
the couple of things that I saw, again, it comes from points, and I don't really like it when it does come from points, um, particularly when they're closed off like they are on this. Uh, and I'm actually going to share my screen because I thought you guys could see my screen, <laughs> and I realized I'm not showing anything. So we'll pull my screen up here a little bit. So generally when you're coming off and you're pulling off to a point like this, you really want to come to a point um, and throw a couple of stitches down in the vertical direction to sever the foam on that end. Um, and they didn't really do that. So I don't see this cleanly perforating on the ends. And so it's more than likely difficult to pull the foam off. The other thing that I noticed too is, and I believe I understand what they were going for with this lighter satin underneath, but doing a wider satin or a shorter satin underneath, essentially an underlay with wide open needle penetrations. And then you follow that with a cover stitch with wide open needle penetrations. You're not going to cleanly perforate the puff. So then when you go to rip it off, you're going to get, you're going to have excessive cleanup, I guess is what I'm trying to right. say. Right. Um, the other thing that I noticed when I was looking at this is I went and measured the satin columns. They are just shy of four millimeters wide. Um, typically, if it's under four millimeters, I don't like to do 3D puff. And it's simply because you're getting narrow enough that your machine's tension is going to just compress that foam down. And so um, the only way I've ever been able to achieve under four millimeter um, 3D puff is generally by adjusting the tensions on my machine. And when I do 3D puff, I don't like to adjust the tension on my machine at all. Um, and so it, it tends to be a trade-off. This is, to me, it's borderline. So I think that you would be able to get away with it. Um, but I wouldn't want to go too much smaller than that. Um, the other thing I looked at when I watched the font down here, um, run and, you know, looking at this font here and this font here, they're similar. I don't think that they're the same, but they're fairly similar. And I think that you could get away with using this font. Um, but one of the big things that stood out to me and I was actually, I wasn't even looking for this. I was looking for the travel run settings because they didn't use underlay. And so when you get these little travel runs, like it just jumped across right there, typically those are longer. So if you set your center run underlay stitch length to let's say one and a half um, millimeters, when it does do the travel, it's still going to do it at like two and a half millimeters and you're going to get a chance of that poking out. Um, and so I was actually looking for the setting to, ch to check what that travel run underlay was, and I did not find it. So if you know where it is, drop that in the comments, because I'd love to know. Um, but what actually stood out to me is right here on the very first letter, I noticed when it goes and it plays and it's coming slowly, it drops one stitch and it goes to the edge and it just starts doing the cover satin. Um, now when you're doing that, they're... I have a lot of reasons why you need to have a tie-in. <laughs> I'm sure Justin can think of a few too. But the one that I see most frequently is, is when you try to run something that doesn't have a tie-in and your needle drops in and it just tries to go, what happens is the thread will pull out of your needle because there's nothing to anchor it when that take-up lever comes up. Right. And so people will look at that and they'll go, I, I changed my needle, I've been adjusting my tensions, I can't figure out why the thread keeps pulling out of the needle when it starts and it's and it can actually be the file this is one of those problems that i can induce on your machine if i click the wrong button on a setting um i am going to pull in a couple more comments here we have matt we'll throw popcorn at him because he's not here hey matt how's it going and he asked do you lower tension for sub four millimeter and i have in the past i don't know about you justin do you tend to do that when you start getting sub four millimeter no, I, I loosen my density a little bit on the top density because it, it, cause I think it's almost like I'm compensating for that, that extra tension that you get in, in, in sub four millimeters. So I, I, I loosen the density. It kind of makes up for the where it'll still cut the foam. But yes, you do still get that a little bit more compressed foam. I mean, it's still going to be a little bit more raised than, than flat, uh, non-3D embroidery. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely not going to be as puffy or as, as uh, raised as something that's a little bit thicker and wider. I don't, I don't like messing with tensions for 3D foam. I think it just sets you up to mess up your machine that was running well beforehand. And, yep. and I think, I think to, to, to fine-tune that 
that tension to your density and the way it's digitized. There's just too many factors that you're trying to adjust to get to get to get that sweet spot. It's not worth it. Right. And typically, you know, the majority of the embroiderers that I see, and there's plenty of exceptions, but most of the ones that I see are new. And tension is something that is still a bit of a mystery to them. And then they go and they crank on the tension knob and it messes up the tension. And then they go through troubleshooting and troubleshooting and troubleshooting to get it back to where it was sewing good. Right. Um, so I'm going to bring in a comment here because I do remember this and <laughs> it was a frustrating week for Matt frustrating week for Matt. Remember when I got my used happy, I spent a week trying to fix it when it was the file. And that's exactly what it was, is there was no lock stitches in when it was tying in. And so the thread kept pulling out of the needle and it ended up being the file. And I've actually seen this happen on new machines too, where the lock stitches aren't short enough and it's pulling the thread out of the needle. And it, I mean, it's really, really frustrating when it it's the file, but you think it's the machine. Right. <laughs> So um, we have Kirsten here from West Texas. Hello, how's it going? And that catches me up on topics, or not topics, comments. It's been a long day. Um, so other than that, I was looking at the text here. Um, I noticed that in her picture it sewed out pretty rough. And these are 0.93 millimeter columns, and there is no underlay um, assigned to it. There's no... I, I mean, I've better preference that there's no underlay assigned to it. So what we're we're seeing in there, and I'm going to go ahead and start it again here, and I've got it running really slow, so I can actually analyze the stitches. But what we're seeing here is every run that's in there that ends up being a center run underlay is a travel run. And so watching some of these run, you're getting into the little bit longer stitch lengths, and we can actually measure it. So I'm a big fan of the measure tool, and I can hit the period key on my keyboard, and it's going to show me the needle penetrations and then I can go and I can measure from here to here and it's 1.16 millimeters which is actually okay and I, it's a little bit further off to the right side than I would like um, because the chances are the closer you get to the sides if you're not right down the center and it's a really really narrow column is when that needle comes down it's going to find the path of least resistance it's not going to sever a piece of thread so when it comes down the thread is either going to go to the right side of the needle or the left side of the needle and if it goes to the wrong side of the needle, now you've got a little loop sticking out and your text looks fuzzy, I guess. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of the right term for it. But typically when you see people in group say, in group say, take out the underlay, that's why they're saying that is because the center run underlay is poking out of the outside. It's not necessarily the best solution to fix the problem, but it is a way to get from point a to point b depending on the material that you're sewing on right see i'm really long-winded justin we got to stop me sometimes <laughs> but um fred here okay. says this explains a problem i have with one particular file thanks and you know it yeah i i will always tell people i can make a file that will make you think your machine is broken <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and it's very very true so sometimes when you're going and you're looking for digitizers or you're trying to do it yourself when you're very first starting because a lot of people do they don't they're coming into the business they think i just bought this expensive software it's going to be easy you can make a file that will make you think your machine is broken mm -hmm. and it will be horrible <laughs> um and so it's important to study this kind of stuff. And that's why I'm a big advocate of outsourcing your digitizing while you learn to digitize so that you can learn embroidery first. Absolutely. Very long winded explanation there. Um, otherwise, when I looked at this file, you know, it, it is a, it is a narrower design and I actually didn't catch um, that it was on a left panel. I thought it was going across the front. And if you notice when it does sew out, it does sew from the left to the right. And I was like, okay, well, not only is it sewing, <laughs> the, the pop's a little bit different than what you typically see, but it's sewing from the left to the right. But that is because it is on a left panel, like Justin said, and he right. showed in the picture. So um, going from the left to the right does make sense in this situation. But if it was larger and put on the center of the hat, then it would need to be center out. Right. So those are the things that I noticed. So yeah, so we, we got the weird underlay. 
We've got the non-capped and tapered ends when it doesn't match the art. You have the start and stop points that I think need to be adjusted or the junctions need to be adjusted. Um, I mean, overall, I mean, I, this is one of those ones where I just start from scratch. There was, there was so much editing to do and with it being such a, a simple design, I think it would probably take me longer to try to edit all out that need, doesn't need to be there or changed than just to do it from scratch. So, yeah, I mean, by the time you add caps and the travel, the pathing stitches, I mean, you've pretty much redone the letter already. <laughs> right. right. Um, and, and and if and if someone were to bring me this design, I mean, I I did do it in three D puff. Um, but going back to their original design, and I was trying to get as close as possible to the to the original artwork, um, the satin widths actually got a little bit skinnier. So um, that's where you would want to adjust the density just a bit. And I cap the ends straight so it matched the 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 artwork a bit more and yeah that is a little bit it's two just over two millimeters so that's honestly if it was um if if somebody brought this file to me and they said i wanted it in 3d puff i, I would say are you sure right <laughs> this would be me communicating back to them you know these are really really narrow columns chances are it's not going to have the 3d puff effect that you're gonna that you're that you're actually looking for Exactly, and and this is where where it comes down to like we we've discussed in the past, we discussed in the you know part one of our webinar. Um, first step is to is to analyze the design and see if it's even right for for three D pop. Um, to me, uh, a lot of times companies will have a a logo uh, that's the full name of the company, but they have a, an alternative insignia like maybe just this. D with the drop or just the drop and that's something you, you could bring it up to them hey do you guys just do uh, something simple on the sleeve of, of a polo shirt uh, on the back label of a polo shirt um, especially going on the left panel I think if they would have done just this drop or or if, if it was just the D with the drop you could have made it a lot bigger nice and bold and it would have worked a lot better as 3D puff and yep. I think it would have made a little bit more of a of an impact. Well, and there is one thing that I, I will add to that is chances are they're wearing a shirt with their logo on it already. Right. <laughs> and you're adding a hat with their logo on it. Um, it, it it's a toss up to me. I will I would definitely ask them if they have a branding guide. I know larger companies have branding guides with alternate logos. Um, right. and, and it's for situations like this when you start getting into confined areas. They say, okay, well, here's our full logo. Here's our simplified logo. Here's our, our alternative logo. And one of the, the best um, representations of that I can think of are universities. If you look at any university, they have a consistent logo, but they have like five of them. <laughs> and right. it depends on where it's going and what it's going on. And they do that because they've, went back and forth with decorators sign companies um trying to think of other places that they've gone back and forth with but generally they you know they want to put their logo on something and they've ran into resistance and they said okay we need to go back to the drawing board and we need to we need to create something for every medium that we're going to put it on right so yeah and it's a way to, to to make sure that their their insignia or their logo is consistent as well so people aren't just changing the way they want to change it you know, shrinking it, stretching it, whatever. Um, so yeah, they have their their corporate guidelines. Or I know the university here that we have, um, uh, we're licensed to do work with. There's there's a whole online de database with what they call their lockups. And when you there's a department or or anything else, you have to go find their official lockup. And they have they have all kinds of like you just said. They have their primary, alternative online you know all these different ones for for each design print right? sign vehicle exactly. side hat shirt exactly. 
stroller. <laughs> like everything. Um, I'm going to grab a couple of comments real here. We have Bevy Dean watching from Michigan. Hello. And Lisa watching. Hello, Lisa. So on this, I know that I've looked at, I've looked at your approach, and you said that you started from scratch. Is there any part of the design that you preserved and did edit? Just the bottom text. The bottom text. Okay. Because um, she she did say something on her post about she knew that the bottom text didn't look good, and I don't know if she said she fixed it. I mean, the file that she gave us, um, like you said, there were, there was no underlay. It was pretty sub height wise as far as text is concerned. Uh, I made it a little bit bigger in the area. I changed the density because that was another thing. She had a pretty high density for as small as the as the text was. Um, it's one of those things. The bigger elements go, the more density you typically want to use. The smaller the elements are, the less density. Uh, you don't want to jam as many stitches as you can in a in a small little area. So, um, so I just I scaled it up just a bit, changed the density, added the the underlay back in. So one of the things that that it's actually a misconception for a lot of people, especially when they start, is that as you get smaller, you want less density, and as you get lit larger, you want more density. Um, a lot of people, when they start, they think, okay, well, it's small. It needs to have a lot of stitches so that it'll look clean. But actually, when you remove a lot of those stitches, it, it looks cleaner. Um, exactly. And so I'm going to pull a couple of more comments here. We have Tracy saying hello from British Columbia. Hello. And do you ever have webinars on basic digitizing? We have webinars planned. Um, and so uh, hopefully we'll have some soon. Um, but currently right now we're working on our webinar series. I'm going to go ahead and shamelessly plug you, Justin. Um, <laughs> Justin's been doing a webinar series on 3D Puff. Uh, currently, the first of the three-part series has been done. It's a little bit more on actually sewing and kind of basic, very, very basic digitizing. The next one that's coming up is going to be kind of an intermediate, which is um, a little bit more into digitizing theory and concepts on how to do 3D puff. And then coming up, I want to say right before July, is going to be a advanced digitizing for 3D puff. And so those are the three that we have tallied out for Justin. Um, I am working with uh, Lee Caroselli of Balboa Threadworks on getting a webinar in as well for her. Um, shameless plug, there you go. <laughs> but uh, that is um, that is what we currently have planned and we've been working on some different aspects to get into more basic digitizing, but that is what we currently have plan. And so Randall Boggs here asks, should we watch the first one? I highly recommend watching the first one. Um, I think it's good for, even if you don't do digitizing, it's, it's good to watch because it gives you things to look for when you're running a file that can help you communicate back with your digitizer. It also goes over some of the cleanup um, as well as the steps on how to sew it out and how to make it, how to make it pop and look really, really good. Um, right. I'll, I'll let you answer that one too, Justin. I think it's a good idea. I mean, I mean, if you feel you're at a level where you've already been doing 3D foam and, and you kind of get the gist of, of the basics, it's not like you're going to be lost in part two. Uh, I'm going to do a quick review of the first one in the beginning of part two, just to kind of go over some terms and stuff that you're going to hear me use. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's kind of like watching part one of a movie in a series. You just kind of get the background of, of where I'm going. Uh, part two is not going to be all digitizing, so I don't want to, to everybody to think it's it's just for digitizers. Um, it's just going to be a little bit more heavier on digitizing theory for, for 3D foam. But there's going to be some neat stuff that I, that I show uh, the techniques on how to do on the machine as well. I'm excited for it. I watched the first one. I'm going to watch the second one, and I'll probably watch <laughs> the third one. And I'm excited for all three. So... Um, I highly recommend it. Um, and yeah, back to the design. We got sidetracked. I got sidetracked. Back to the design. Yeah, I get sidetracked really, really easily. Um, so with this design, it you did end up starting from scratch and you capped all the ends. Um, that's a horrible cap. Don't look. 
<laughs> and it's still crooked. Don't look. This is why Jeff can't digitize <laughs> in in software after eight thirty at night my time. Um, so you went through and you, you added caps. I'm sure you walked stitch down to the other side and added a cap. So there is a good question that just came in the comments, and again is by R Mr. Randall Boggs. Um, he asks, "Is it software specific? I only have generations." No, uh, I use Wilcom, so you're going to see the screen of Wilcom uh, as far as what I'm using. Uh, the first part, I believe. There was pretty much nothing software specific. Uh, there might be a few things here and there that I'm going to show you the technique on Wilcom, um, but I'm going to try to explain. I mean, I I know a lot of softwares out there. Uh, generalized. Uh, I've used a few. I don't know exactly. There's just a few terms that might be called something different on one software or the other. Pretty much does the same function. Um, but I, I'm going to do my best to explain it in, in general terms and more more theory, not software specific. And there you go. <laughs> and Matt says, I'm worse at digitizing live. I am pretty bad at it too. Um, I tend to get a little lost as I, as I move around. But that's generally because I think I get kind of in a zone. And then you get out of the zone <laughs> when you're talking as well as digitizing, and it, it causes me issues sometimes. It's so hard, it's hard. It's hard to talk and digitize at the same time. It's kind of like walking and chewing gum at the same time. Yeah, I don't do that either. <laughs> so essentially, we're going to make sure that we cap all the ends, um, and we prepare junctions to be handled handled by the 3d puff i have to make sure that i'm not doing things um and see this is me walking and chewing bubble gum at the same time i <laughs> just <laughs> stop uh we'll pull matthew's uh comment off there and randall says you have sold you have me sold justin so we're excited to see you at the uh at the webinar for those of you guys that are coming we're going to be re we're really excited for hosting it and not only that um we're also excited for the content that Justin's that Justin's putting out. He's worked pretty hard on it, um, and it showed in the first one, and it's definitely going to show um, in the second one. So Matt says, you really leaving my comment up a long time to really rub it in. So for that, I'm going to digitize the rest of this letter while his comment is up uh, just to make sure that he feels included. <laughs> oh but I'm going to walk over to here. Um, I tend to like to walk to the end of an object with a satin, and then I'll throw in my bridge. Um, and I also do that with caps. I know other people do it differently, um, but that's how I like to, that's how I like to do it, and I'm used yeah. to doing it that way. Are you using fills there? Shh. I'm changing them. Only you would notice, Justin. Way to point it out. <laughs> so 0.17. We'll go ahead and increase the density there. And then I can walk the rest of this coming back this way. And I'll overlap a couple of stitches because I like to. And I'll come in just a little ways there. So I'll, I'll, I'll do the play-by-play. -play. So he's, he's coming across that horizontal line, stopping short, throwing down a plank where the... Two lines meet perpendicular. Make sure that that foam doesn't, where those two lines are coming together like this, that foam has a tendency to want to find the least path of resistance and come out from the stitches that's cutting it. So you, go, you lay down that that bridge there to, to hold down the foam while it's going different directions. It's turning the corner. So he walks down, does the cap at the bottom. <laughs> Do you usually digitize in TrueView? 
typically. Do you? Mm hmm I do. I'm weird that way, though. I'm always toggling back and forth, though. I, you know, I like to look at it because if I pull it up in True View, it's going to show me the shift, like between these two columns where I'm lining them up. I'll see that shift will stick out a little bit more to me. Um, but when I'm trying to like line up objects, like I'm trying to line this satin stitch up with that other one over there, I'm going to make sure that I um, am in True View. And yeah, so I typically do. Um, this cap is not going to be as long as I want it, but it'll still. While you're doing that, I'm going to pull up some comments here. Uh, so, Randall, Matthew is so nice to put up the link here to part one. So, if you want to grab some popcorn tomorrow night and watch part one, have an adult beverage. Adult Check beverage. Out, adult beverage. And. Eric is announcing, reminding everybody that we will be on Two Regular Guys tomorrow with Eric Campbell and Aaron Montgomery. We are pretty stoked about that. I have actually, believe it or not, so you guys can laugh at me later. Um, I've wanted to do that for a while, but I've never been able to think of like a topic to officially put in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought about writing in myself, but it's it's kind of like you said, like, well, what, what do I want to talk about? Yep. So, I'll just. So Eric it says I toggle and zoom in and out so much that I make people motion sick if they want to watch me when I'm digitizing without the intention of an audience. I pretty much do the same thing. When yeah. I'm in a groove, when I when I'm in a groove, my left hand is clicking away and, and doing three different things while my right hand's clicking on the mouse. Yeah, and you can see how much I'm zooming in and out and making everybody motion sick as I do it because it you get, you get very used to going in and making small adjustments. Like right here, I have a small stitch. Now, this is something that sticks out really well in TrueView versus the wireframe, but I do have this random stitch where it's jumping out to the outside and it's moving over and that's simply because of where my start and stop point is. And so if I move my stop point over there, because these objects are so close, it's adding in that auto jump. And so by moving that over there, now it's going to jump across instead of try to jump out and over. Um, and it gets rid of that little piece sticking out. While Justin was uh, talking, if you guys didn't notice, I went and I pulled all my caps out a little bit. When you do 3D puff, it really pushes. Um, and if you don't have your caps sticking out far enough, what ends up happening is it, I, I call it a waterfall. I don't know what you call it. Yeah. But, but basically these end stitches here won't sit on top of the cap. They'll fall off that other end. They'll get really loose and it'll look, it doesn't look right. <laughs> that's, that's the best way I can say it. Right. I mean, you got to remember, you, you, you always have your push and pull on embroidery. Uh, so when you're doubling, essentially doubling your, your density, uh, so it cuts that foam, you got to you gotta realize it's going to be that much more push. Uh, yep. Especially when you have the element of that cap at the end where there's something visual there that could actually fall over and, and run off that, that rigid foam and come off the other end. You're going to have these weird loose waterfall uh threads at the end yep and that's when you are as you go up as you build dimension these are factors that you now have to consider as you're doing it um embroidery changes and i know eric said it quite a few times but embroidery is a holistic approach so it's your interaction between your stabilizer your thread your fabric or your whatever medium you're sewing on but as you start to add layers and move up you're now adding more that's going to be affected by that whole holistic approach and when you've got foam you're adding dimension up if you start stacking stitches on top of each other let's say you're layering fills now you're introducing too many needle penetrations you're going to make it stiff like cardboard you're also going up and it's gonna it, it's interesting the types of effects effects you can get if you're not being conscious of all of the pieces that you're going to be dealing with right i hope that made sense maybe 
<laughs> What's the hardest part? Yeah, that right there. Um, Matt, when is Eric going to join us? Uh, anytime he wants. He just has that's to say, let's the, do it. That's the official invite. If he ever has a minute of a breather to do anything else. Yep. So uh, for those of you guys that don't know, Eric is going to be doing, he actually does two shows on Friday or three shows on Friday. Three shows, yeah. So there's going to be the um, the two regular guys that he's going to be producing as well as being on coming up tomorrow with, uh, we're going to be on it with them as a guest. Um, there is the half that he does with Aaron Montgomery, I believe. Make sure I don't get the names wrong. Um, where it's 30 minutes and they have a really hard cutoff. And that and that one's actually my favorite. I'll be honest with you guys. The hard cutoff is kind of exciting. To, I laugh every time. Yep, you're, you're anticipating as it comes up, and you're like, ah, is he going to finish this thought? And then, yeah, I really, really like it. It's one of my favorite ones. Um, and then there is the take-up, which is a little bit later in the day. I know I pick my son up from school, and I come home, and I watch it. Um, and all three of them are great, great education. Um, if, you, if you're looking to learn more about the industry, then – I highly recommend watching all of them um, yeah. as well as ours. I highly recommend all our stuff too, but <laughs> uh, that's one of the places that I go for my education. And um, so I, I don't have a problem recommending it. So Eric says, you got it. I'm in. So we're going to hold you to that. And you are right. Heck, you are better than Aaron with last names. <laughs> I, I've gotten names wrong and I will get names wrong and I will continue to get names wrong. So um, we'll jump back to the design here. I'm trying to be conscious of the time. Uh, one thing I didn't do when I usually start is lock the art. I moved the art and I didn't lock it. And so sometimes I'll accidentally move it. And I also didn't pull out my underlay here. So we're going to go grab all of these satin stitches that I put down. That should be enough of them. And I'm going to go to my underlay tab and I'm going to make sure that there is no underlay on any of them because I want only my stitches, only my traveling stitches that I put in, I want going down. And when you manually path like this, you can really cut down the number of stitches that it does just traveling. If you set your endpoints, you know, it might walk to one end and then come back and do a, a zigzag and then walk back up and do a center run or an edge run and then start moving up. I've seen it pass over the same point five times in software as it, if when you get into more complex curves and stuff, it really starts throwing down the number of stitches where you can manually control that and um, lower the stitch count. So uh, Letty here says, love to take up, try to make sure my work issue is wrapped up so I can listen in. I do as well. And Matt says, NPM run watch. He'll decode that for me later, I'm sure. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to skip over the rest of the letters. You guys have seen how I would do the H, and I'd pretty much do that on the Y, the Z, and the R, and that's an A. I keep I keep thinking it's an O, but it's an A, right? I don't know. Yeah. I saw it as an O, too. And see, the, the file name has oh, an A in it. I think it's an O. Yeah, but the file name has an A in it. It could be an O. <laughs> I would go with it as an O, but I'm going to skip over to uh, this D. Because of this raindrop, it does make it a little bit unique and a little more challenging to do the full letter. Um, and so I'm going to show you guys how I approached it, and then we'll jump over to Justin's screen, and we can look at how he would approach it. So one of the things that I would do that I'm starting to do here is I'm actually going to start putting down a bridge and I'm going to bring it around the perimeter of these two objects that are going to intersect. Um, I want to make sure that I'm giving them something, a little some a little support in there to help um, hold everything together. And I'll come up to right about there. Um, what kind of density do you use on your bridge when you're using a satin? So when I do a, a satin, I tend to go with like a 0.7 on my bridge. Mm -hmm. anywhere from a 0.5 to a 0.7 it just really depends on kind of the area that i'm going under and how i'm wanting the stitches to lay down um yeah it just really depends <laughs> on, on the area that i'm going to and so here i'm making sure that i'm catching this junction here because it as this 
D comes around, there's a good chance that I'm going to get separation there. And I want to make sure that I'm compensating for that. I'm a little less worried about separation coming in between these two elements, uh, but it is something that I have to keep in mind. And so after I, and I'm actually going to change the shape just a little bit here. And I'm going to change my start and my stop points so that I'm starting over here. I'm going to tie in over there and I'm going to tie out over here. Um, I guess not tie out, but I can start walking from here and walk up and get my cap in. And I'll go right there. And I like to use the space bar. I don't know how many keyboard shortcuts you use, Justin, but that's all I do all day is keyboard shortcuts. Um, I am going to have... Absolutely. You got, you got to know your keyboard shortcuts or your software. I'm going to go ahead and bring that up just a little bit. Um, I'm watching on my lines that I have coming across here. I am just a little under that line so I can come down just a little bit. And this is why I zoom in and zoom out a lot so that I can make sure that things are straight. Um, call me annoying, but it bugs me sometimes. So I'm, I'll come across here. And I'm just going to come straight down. And this is where it's good to work in wireframe mode. Um, I am going to put junction or a set of nodes right there as I'm coming in. And then again right here. Because a lot of times with these letters, they'll actually kick out a little bit as you get into the inner portion of the letter. Um, and I can just start walking around the art here. And you can tell me all the things I'm doing wrong, Justin. I'll let you. <laughs> it's not wrong, just different. You know, it's, it's very, very true that if you ask a bunch of digitizers how to digitize foam, you're going to get a lot of different answers because there's a lot of different ways to approach this. Um, I am going to end right about there. Um, and then I believe I can just start this object. We'll see if it jumps it. And I'll come around to right about there and let it push in and it did jump that so that would be my initial letter and let me make sure i take out the underlay and all of this stuff you know i could do this the easy way and actually click the button um before i start digitizing but that would take the fun out of it <laughs> oh so now i've got the d that's coming down i've got a little wonkiness going on right here so we'll change that node to fix it gives me a little bit more of a straight line and then of course we'll go in with a color change and we'll have to handle this point so um how i would do it is i'd start right about here and make sure that i don't have anything selected and i'm going to throw a few needle penetrations in here and then i like to wrap it a little and then come up to the top and I'll start from there. Now, I am going to change my stitch length here. I like to do that to about, a, I'm going to go to a nine here. Um, generally, when I walk with, when I use run stitches with 3D Puff, I actually use it more like manual stitch editing. Um, I open it up so that every node that I put turns out to be a, um, a stitch. And then I would come... And this is probably where we're going to handle it differently. Is coming to this end. And I'm actually looking at it as I'm approaching it. And this is one of those reasons why um, I should have looked at it first. <laughs> yeah. is because I'm going to take this out. We're going to, we're going to stop right there. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to put in a little bit of a cap. And I'll come in about there and we'll go with a little bit of a rounded cap to take care of the bottom so I've, I've set that down and now i'll come and i'll walk over there um and we'll move those two objects to the front and now i'll come here starting about right here and i can come down along the letter or the raindrop however you would prefer to call it justin we'll let you go with that the water drop the water drop yeah and then i'll come here to the end and i'll slightly come in just a little bit further but not too much and i'll end like that so that is how i would handle that letter um 
I'm interested to see how Justin handled it. So I will go ahead and pull his screen up here. Nothing embarrassing on your screen, right, Justin? No. <laughs> All right. So I'm a big believer of, of putting a couple of tack down stitches uh, right at the beginning of foam. Um, I know typically people use tape or rubber bands or something like that. Um, but sometimes they have a tendency to slip and tape tends to come off and your foam shifts in the middle of the run that doesn't make your life too happy. So I actually throw down one on each very end of each end. Uh, so, it, so it locks down that foam on, on either side. So I usually just do a couple of run stitches on the left, a couple of run stitches on the right. I like to tack down in the middle and I actually use my tack down in the middle as my bridge that I know is going to be there between the water drop and the D. Since I'm already stitching there, might as well utilize the, the tack down stitches as well. So I pretty much did the same approach when it came to the letters. Uh, the only real difference I see with yours and mine is I came from the inside of the D. Uh, I threw down some bridges there, came from the inside of the D, came around to the right side and end at the top. And the only other thing that I kind of see differently is that Zoom enhance, zoom enhance. Yes. <laughs> Hand zoom enhance. All right. Um, when I came across with the with the D, I I tend to come inside. Uh, anytime there's an element underneath another element that's going to go on top, I I overcompensate that. Um, I I just want to make sure that there's not going to be these two stitches uh, for two reasons. There's not going to be these two stitches pulling away from each other like you saw in her actual sample. Um, and also, if you have the needle penetrations on one element pretty close to the needle penetrations on the next element, you're going to get some crowding in there. You possibly get some thread breaks, worst case scenario, some needle breaks, especially when you're when you're overlapping a lot of stuff and you have needle penetrations like things like on seams of the dreaded Richardson 112s, um, it's just going to cause some heartache. So I like to keep those net needle penetrations kind of staggered from each other. Uh, the, the two satins overlapped quite a bit to make sure that there's no pulling apart. So those are the only two main things that I see because pretty much I... I did the same where I walked up to the point. I did the the bottom first, came up, walked, did my little point support, and came down. And I noticed that both of us, when it comes to a rounded object, uh, typically when when you're using caps like at the ends of, of straight columns, you, you do want to do that little bit of comp compensation to make sure there's no waterfall, but you don't have the, the cap sticking out too much. On rounded object, objects, I actually use that cap as part of as the contour of that end. Because so if you if you bring that drop too far down and it's got that straight edge, it's going to push and look flat at the bottom. So since you got to cap it anyways, um, it actually looks pretty clean once sewn. It, it that that whole bottom of the drop looks more rounded when when you're using that cap. And I see that both of us kind of use that technique as well. So. I don't think there's that much difference than the way we did it. Yeah. I mean, ask digitizers how to do puff. You're going to get a different answer from just about everyone. We all look at it and approach it a little differently. And there's not really, as, as far as I've seen, there's not really a hard and fast rule. There are some things that were done initially that aren't necessarily done anymore. Um, and, and there are very good reasons for that. And all of it is the product of embroidery is not the file. The product of your embroidery is the embroidery. And Eric says that all the time. That's where I heard it from. Um, and so a lot of the reasons why those 
hard edge runs under lathe aren't used much anymore is simply because they were poking out near like in your experience it, it never really sewed out cleanly and looked good right um, i i am going to bring up one comment here that did make me laugh do you ever get the feeling that Justin is silently judging your digitizing <laughs> on a scale from flat digitizing to textured? Um, we're going to go with, on that scale, the flat digitizing. <laughs> that was wrong, Matt. <laughs> I'm sure it's an inside joke for everybody that's listening, unless somebody caught that live where I insulted Jeff. And it was fantastic. I highly recommend going back and looking through all our lives to find the right one because it was pretty funny. Um, but other than that, you know, I don't think that there's too much more that we would do to do to this file. Unfortunately, we didn't have a time to get a stitch out of it uh, when it was done. But hopefully, we'll be able to get some pictures of one when she sews out the file. We can get some pictures and post them up. Yeah, I'm hoping uh, I reached out to her uh, yesterday and she just said she doesn't have, she didn't have time to run the hats yet. So um, hopefully she'll post it in the group, see the results. Um, so the changes that we made, not only I think we're going to get a cleaner sewn design and cleaner 3D puff, but we actually shaved off almost a thousand stitches as well. So um, there's that saving uh, without putting all those extra stitches that either aren't going to cut the foam or it's going to mash down the foam when you have those extra stitches that you don't need. Yep. So if you guys really liked the live today, I hope you did. Um, you're going to learn all this and more hopefully on Saturday with Justin's um, webinar. So I highly recommend that you guys go and register for that. Um, upcoming education is, is tomorrow. We've got the two regular guys. We have, Tentatively, we have a webinar with Lee Caraselli. We're still nailing down the subject and the time. And then the third part of Justin's webinar that's going to be coming up at the end. Um, Eric is also doing a webinar on patches. Uh, I highly recommend to get that if you would like. Um, I went to his Demystifying Next Level Digitizing class, which is a recording, and you can purchase the recording. It is still for sale. Hopefully, Eric, if you're still watching, you can drop those links in the comments for everyone that's viewing. Um, but that is the upcoming education that we have going on. And uh, with that, I'll push this button so now that we don't see any screens anymore. Um, Unless if you have anything else that you wanted to go over on the file, Justin, I think we've covered it pretty well. Yeah, we covered it pretty well. Uh, two regular guys tomorrow, 8 West Coast, 11 East Coast. I don't know what time in your central part of the universe. It, it's 10, the only time zone that matters. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we, we have that coming up. We're really, really excited for that. So um, with that, that's Justin Armenta from JA Digitizing Studios. I'm Jeff Fuller from Fuller Embroidery Works, and we're both here with the Embroidery Nerd. Thank you guys for hanging out with us, and have a great night. Good night, guys.